A young man on horseback prepares to throw his weapon. This is Alexander himself. To discover the tomb of Alexander the Great's father was remarkable enough. But what the archaeologists were not prepared for, what no one could even have imagined, was the amazing treasure that they found inside. Incredibly, the actual bones of Philip II were found inside this solid gold case. Also inside the burial chamber, his gold-leafed crown and war armor, including breastplates, helmets, and shields. Following his father's burial, Alexander immediately faces the greatest challenge of his young life, proving to the citizens of Macedonia that he deserves to be king. Alexander was only 20 years old when he inherited his kingdom, which at that moment was beset by formidable jealousies and feuds. Alexander's Macedonian advisors feared that a crisis was at hand and urged the young king to leave the Greek states to their own devices and refrain from using any force against them. Alexander, however, chose the opposite course and decided that the only way to make his kingdom safe was to act with audacity and a lofty spirit. He was certain that if he were to yield even a fraction of his authority, all his enemies would attack him at once. Within six months, Alexander leads the Macedonian army to regain control of Greece, earning the respect of his troops with decisive, courageous direction. To the horror of Cleopatra, who later commits suicide, Alexander's mother Olympias orders the execution of Philip's newborn son, leaving himself as the only possible heir to the Macedonian throne. King Alexander then turns his attention toward what would become his life's goal, the conquest of Persia. But first, in the tradition of his father, Alexander decides to seek counsel from the Oracle at Delphi to determine if he is indeed destined by the gods to defeat Darius and rule all of Asia. Unlike Philip, however, who always sent an emissary, Alexander goes himself in November of 335 BC. When Alexander arrives here at Delphi, he is told that he has come at the wrong time of year. The oracle cannot be consulted during the winter months. He must return in the spring. Alexander, not being one to take no for an answer, goes to the priestess and tries to drag her by force here to the temple. At last overcome by his persistence, she cries out, You are invincible, my son. When he hears this, Alexander declares that he needs no other prophecy. He has obtained the answer he was seeking. As with many stories describing Alexander, it is difficult to separate myth from reality in the accounts of his visit to Delphi. But Alexander's passionate desire to please the gods and seek their guidance is a recurring theme in his life. As he is about to embark on what will be a 12-year journey, Alexander may or may not have a notion that he himself has some form of deified lineage. When he leaves for Asia, his mother Olympias tells him that upon his return, she will reveal an incredible secret about his life. Many believe Olympias will address the haunting question that only she can answer. Is Alexander the son of a god, or is he a mere mortal man? In 334 BC, King Philip II of Macedon is dead, assassinated by his own bodyguard. 
Conspiracy theories suggest that his wife Olympias and son Alexander may have been involved, but no one can say for certain. Alexander, at age 20, becomes king and wastes no time asserting his authority. He chooses to continue a massive offensive his father had begun, the conquest of Asia and the defeat of the most powerful ruler on earth, Persian king Darius. He rarely had no choice but either to withdraw that force or reinforce it and have a full-scale war of annexation, which was, of course, the alternative that he chose. I don't think he ever thought of anything else. And I don't think even from the beginning, that there was any limit on his ambition of conquest. Alexander's invasion starts with a daunting logistical maneuver, transporting his army of 40,000 across the body of water separating Europe and Asia, the Hellespont. Today, the Hellespont is known as the Dardanelles. Ferry boats travel back and forth across the strait, here, Alexander's troops cross into Asia, transported on an assortment of man-powered rowing vessels. Moving such a massive force is fraught with peril due to the possibility of foul weather and the fact that the navy of Persian King Darius is three times as large. This is the Asian shore of the Hellespont. The current here is strong and the winds can be brutal. Alexander's ships could be very vulnerable to naval attack as they ferry the army across. But Alexander has two strokes of luck. The weather is fine and the huge Persian fleet is far away, quelling a revolt in Egypt. Alexander doesn't hesitate. He's been dreaming of this moment, leading his troops into Asia to begin the conquest of the Persian Empire. He sets sail. Halfway across, sacrificing a bull to the sea god, Poseidon. He's first to set foot on the Asian shore, hurling his spear into the sand, claiming to receive Asia from the gods. He is not aware that nearby, the forces of Darius are gathering, determined that this should be Alexander's first and last trial of strength. Persian King Darius considers young Alexander an upstart to be quickly vanquished. The Persian ruler chooses not to waste his time commanding the troops himself. Instead, he sends his most trusted general Memnon, a Greek mercenary who chooses a battleground where the terrain will work in his favor, the Granicus River. This is the Granicus today. In Alexander's time, it is three times as wide and deep. Alexander is accompanied by his own trusted advisors, military commander Parmenio, his close friend Hephistion, and Callisthenes, a nephew of Aristotle, who serves as Alexander's personal historian. On the high opposite bank of the Granicus River, the Persian army waits, with 20,000 cavalry and 20,000 infantry, many of them Greek mercenaries. Greek author and general Arian wrote about Alexander's first test of will. Parmenio came to Alexander and argued, we cannot take the army across the river on a broad front. A failure in our first action will at once have serious consequences and will put at risk the result of the whole war. Alexander replied, I know that but I would be ashamed if I could cross the Hellespont easily and then found that this little stream could prevent us from crossing. It does not fit in with the way I react when I meet danger. Alexander proceeds to organize his army for a bold attack, one that many military leaders might consider foolhardy. Alexander plays a key role in the offensive brazenly wearing a white-plumed helmet, marking him as the prime target of every enemy soldier. 